Greetings and salutations friends, and welcome back once more to the hellhole that is known as Armageddon. Now that we've gone over the forces available to the two sides, it's time we get started on the ground war. And it begins as it would probably end, with an almighty boom. Gazgul Mag Uruk Thraka had learned of his mistakes last time around, when he had shattered his Orc Horde upon the Hive of Hades. This time he did not intend to have to take Hades, so he simply dumped a bunch of fucking meteors onto the Hive, levelling it and a couple hundred kilometres of nearby countryside. Unfortunately for Gazgul, Yarik had seen this coming, and had evacuated most of the hive. Though, well, there are billions of people inside of a hive, and Yarik had a couple of weeks to evacuate, so we can still assume a fair few civilian casualties, but hey, civvies, who cares? The important part is that most of the Imperial defenders had long since been evacuated. However, just dropping one gargantuan rock upon one single hive is hardly going to win the war, and while it is entirely possible that Gazgul could simply have hung back and pounded the rest of the planet into rubble, that's not the Orc way. Remember, once again, the Orcs came to Armageddon not necessarily to conquer the planet or even to destroy it, but simply looking for a nice big fat fight to get involved in and Armageddon was most definitively ready to acquiesce to the Orc's request for a good old-fashioned rumble. Step one in initiating this particular rumble was of course to allow the Orcs to land on the planet in the first place. Over the last few days, the orbital defences in space had been destroyed. That still left a considerable number of missile defence silos, laser batteries, flak guns, rockets, interception fighters, blah 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 capable of shooting down Orcs as they came down from high orbit. These would have to be neutralised if the Orcs were to reach the planet in any significant numbers. And this is, once again, where Gazgul shows a little bit of, um, uniqueness as far as an orc is concerned. Generally speaking, if an orc wants to neutralize orbital defenses, he will simply either A, dump orcs on top of it until it stops firing back, or B, just simply drop something on it until, again, it stops firing back. Gazgul, however, had taken on a slightly different approach. He had created specialist drop legions. These were the biggest and the baddest orcs, and also the most vertically challenged in many cases, used to high G environments. This meant that he could simply load them up in gigantic metal containers and hurl them at the planet below. Not the most elegant of transportation methods, and not not something that anything but an orc or a space marine could possibly survive, but the sheer speed of these metallic objects hurtling towards the planet meant that shooting them down with conventional ordnance was pretty fucking impossible. Of course, a few canisters here and there would be blasted out of the sky by the sheer fucking volume of flak fire spat up against them, but it did produce significantly less casualties the more traditional way of deploying orcs via aerial insertion, e.g. kicking them out of an aircraft and hoping that somehow that they will survive the landing. In another act of supreme sneakiness and surprising technological know-how, Gazgul also utilised several arrays of teleportation devices located within the largest orc vessels and the orc rooks to teleport orcs directly into Imperial military installations. Granted, this was still orc technology, so probably a solid 75-80% to 80 of said orcs would materialise inside of walls, desks, or other solid objects, but that still left an uncomfortable number of orcs swarming inside of Imperial military facilities. Not to mention, this was a very, very surprising move. Teleportation technology within 40k is extremely scarce, and is usually only utilised when there's a teleportation beacon in place. To teleport troops blindly like this is not only ludicrously risky, but probably a massive waste of resources, as in all due likelihood the majority of the attackers would find themselves teleported inside of the very Earth itself, rather than within the actual military facilities that they're supposed to invade. However, if you've got a couple million orcs in orbit, even if you dump a few hundred thousands of those into the raging oceans of Armageddon, and materialise a couple thousand others inside of toxic waste dumps, as long as a few hundred make it to their destination, all is well.
simply because, once again, surprise and disbelief are the orcs' greatest weapons. While the Imperium might think, there's no way they'd do that, the orcs would simply just go, watch me. After three days of intense fighting, it was made quite obvious that the orcs would not be halted before they reached the planet in considerable numbers. After inflicting heavy casualties upon the drop legions during the first day, the orcs proved to be, well, orcs. The simple fact that most of the drop pods were blasted out of the skies and sent the various orcoid creatures hurling to the ground at 100 meters per second was, for them, a relatively minor inconvenience. Granted, thousands of the little buggers were splattered across the landscape in wonderful blotches of green, but considerably more survived the rather rough landings and would gather up into larger and larger and larger mobs as more and more orcs made it to the surface and eventually began overrunning the orbital defense silos. After three days, most of the planet's defensive silos were already overrun. As a last desperate gambit, Commissar Yarek ordered all the Imperial aerial resources thrown into the fight to attempt to destroy as much of the orcs before they landed as possible. The order stated quite bluntly that any remaining Imperial Navy forces on the planet were to attack the orcs at any cost and destroy as much as possible. This would turn out to be a fairly costly order. In the first few days of the engagement, the Imperial Navy's fighters had considerable advantages over the fighter bombers of the orcs, since they could return to several landing installations all across Armageddon. These bases were also heavily defended with flak and equipped with armoured bunkers, making them virtually impervious to the current level of orc air attacks. Since at this point in time, any major orc aerial actions would have to undergo several steps before they could even get close to an Imperial base. First and foremost, they would of course have to leave their berths in orbit, and orc technology being what it is, that was not an entirely uh, safe procedure. Then they would have to enter the atmosphere again, not entirely safe, then they would have to locate and attack the aerial bases, which would be an even more dangerous proposition, fighting their way through the combat air patrol kept constantly up by the Imperial Navy, attack the base, which is again heavily defended by Flak, then they would have to keep enough fuel in their tanks to re-enter orbit and make their way back to their orbital vessels. And Gazgul was no doubt very, very happy that he had brought tens of thousands of the damn things because they were falling out of the skies at a prodigious rate. Early estimates suggest that the Imperial Navy was able to down six to seven orc craft for every one of their own lost. The Imperial Navy was also able to retrieve most of its pilots, whereas the orcs, well, let's just say that even if the orcs had the, even the faintest concept of search and rescue, they would probably consider it to be a waste of goddamn time and resources. If an orc was silly enough to get himself shot out of the sky, well clearly that orc wasn't worth much. The problem remained, however, that the orcs probably had 10 to 20 as many fighter bombers as the Imperium had thunderbolts or lightnings. During the closing ends of the aerial engagements, the Imperial losses were so heavy that the Imperial Navy began creating marine battalions on the ground from downed pilots, which the Imperial Navy considers to be an absolutely hilarious waste of resources. But well, seeing as the bases were about to get overrun by hordes of screaming greenskins, they might need the extra guns. And it is also quite important to remember a few things when it comes to Orc air power. For example, whilst the Imperial Navy requires fortified bases, control towers, radar installations, miles upon miles of hardened runway, bunkers, hangars, maintenance shops, spare parts, supply lines, rest facilities, recovery services, and preferably even some sanitary facilities, the Orcs only really require a relatively flat area, a potato field for example, and a handful of Gretchens waving amusingly coloured flags around. In other words, it did not take very long at all for the orcs to establish fully functioning, by orc standards, air bases to make up for their initial disadvantages. Additionally, with the hordes upon hordes of orcs getting down to the planet, many airfields were quickly overrun and converted to orc use. Perhaps they'd knock a couple extra holes in the runway, for example, to keep the takeoff and landings interesting. Furthermore, orcs have no functioning grasp of such weak and worthless ideas like airspeed, power to weight ratio, g forces, or even the more useless and frankly baffling concept of maximum bum load. <laughs> As if such a thing could even exist. There is always room for more ducker.
The aerial battle continued for several more days, but on the fifth day it became apparent that Gazgul had considerably bigger plans in motion. Hive Acheron fell to the orcs without a fight. It would appear that the Hive's internal power grid had been sabotaged, and the orcs had boiled up from the interior of the Hive through ancient long-lost tunnels. It was revealed that the architect behind this was the deposed planetary governor Hermann von Straub. He presented himself on television and Vox broadcasts and declared that he had returned as the divine ruler over Armageddon and that the orcs were helping him out. Massive amounts of orcs occupied the hive almost immediately and the bully boy squads dispersed themselves throughout the hive to ensure that everyone listened to the orders of their new overlords. These are essentially the orc equivalent of military police, except bully boys are considered considerably more brutal, although they do not possess the true ingenuity of cruelty that proper military police do. The Officio Assassinarum had already suspected that the Overlord would have joined the Orcs after the First War for Armageddon, seeing as he had pretty much disappeared without a goddamn trace, and the Officio is pretty damn good at tracking people down. As such, they already had agents in position to attempt to assassinate him. Unfortunately for them, the Orcs had also seen that this was probably a possibility, and imagined that somebody would somehow try to put a bullet in the fat Overlord's blank skull, and had prepared several countermeasures. That even the Officio found to be a rather challenging bunch of problems. As such, no immediate assassination was expected to be carried out against the Overlord. Shockingly as well, much of the Hive's nobility rejoice in the return of their Overlord, or, well, perhaps it wasn't quite that shocking. The nobility on Armageddon had been sidelined quite drastically by the new military council. Their power and their prestige was a mere shadow of what they had been under the Overlord of Hermann von Straub. As such, it might not be too surprising that many of them welcomed the return of the Overlord, seeing perhaps a chance to return to the power and prestige of previous days. If the orcs were to be their new proxy overlords, then presuming they could return to their plushy lifestyles, so be it. And of course, the good old-fashioned fact that they had a choice between either servitude or death might also have been somewhat, um, motivational. But whether it be due to threats or simple self-interest was, at the end of the day, rather irrelevant. The fact of the matter was that Hive Acheron had fallen without so much as a shot being fired, or, well, that is not entirely true. The Hive's defenders had put up a desperate rearguard action, but seeing as their defences had been made virtually useless by the fact that the Orcs had come up right behind them, most of the Imperium's defenders were either wiped out rather swiftly over the course of the next few days, or simply abandoned the Hive altogether. And unfortunately for the Imperium, the sneaky blow landed on Acheron was not the only one to fall that day. The defences of Hive Volcanus were overrun in a sudden escalation of Orc hostilities. The Hive had been expected to be relatively safe, with the Orcs concentrating most of their forces on the orbital defences. However, in secret, Gazgul had manoeuvred massive Orc forces to the Hive's outskirts. Suddenly, and with almost no warning whatsoever, the gathering grounds of several regiments of Armageddon Hive militia were assaulted by the Orcs. A full 17 militia regiments were almost instantaneously thrown into panic and routed, leaving behind almost all of their heavy equipment, as well as much of even their small arms. This led to the Orcs being able to quickly surround the Hive and even began bombarding it with Imperial captured weaponry. No doubt the Commissariat would have words with the fleeing 17 regiments, and if they were lucky, they would be subjected to immediate disciplinary actions and probably decimation. And if they were unlucky, well then the people of Armageddon would find themselves with 17 brand new penal regiments to throw at the Orcs. What's that? You lost most of your equipment. Well, don't worry, you're a penal legion now. You don't need any of that. <laughs> 
Outside Hive Deathmire, a similar orc attack met, however, with miserable failure. Once again, Gazgul had attempted to sneak up large forces in the form of the Blackfire tribe. However, they had not countered with the titans of Legio Tempesto and Victorum. With their superior scanning and auspex equipment, they were able to detect the orcs before they had managed to gather in significant quantities. The Titan Legions marched out at the head of their cybernetics guitarii columns and virtually exterminated the entirety of the Blackfire tribe in a three-day pitched battle across the plain of Anthran. With the vast majority of the Orcs' heavy equipment still in orbit, the tribe had virtually nothing with which to stop the titans of Legio Tempestor and Victorum. The only real casualties suffered were a handful of damaged titans and casualties amongst the Legio Cybernetica. It was, in all due essentiality, a complete and utter turkey shoot. Of the Titan Legions and the Cybernetica support forces emerging from the battle virtually unscathed, after having inflicted somewhere around the region of 400,000 to 1 million orc casualties. Assuming that the Blackfire tribe was the rough average of between 20 to 40 mobs that is normal to be seen within a tribe. This was a much, much needed victory for the Imperium. Within one week of the orcs beginning landing, everything had gone to hell in a proverbial handbasket. Hades Hive had been utterly annihilated from orbit. Hive Acheron had fallen to internal treachery. A significant portion of Hive Volcanus defenders had been routed and the Hive surrounded, and if the Hive of Deathmire would have been lost as well, that would have been very, very bad. Four Hives, either captured or surrounded in one week, would be very very horrible, since it would mean that close to a full 30% of the Imperium's defenders on Armageddon would either have been destroyed, captured, or surrounded within seven days of the war beginning. And considering, again, the brutally simple fact that the overwhelming majority of Gazgul's forces had yet to land, that was an unfortunate statistic, to put it rather mildly. And as if all of that was not quite bad enough, it quickly became apparent that the outside Orc forces were not the only Orc threat to Armageddon. It was assumed that the Orcs that had stayed on Armageddon after the First War had mostly been hunted down and destroyed. There were certainly still tribes of feral Orcs available in the equatorial jungle, but these were presumed to be in fairly low numbers. These presumptions were to be proven overly optimistic, as hundreds of thousands of greenskins began pouring out of the equatorial jungle and the Polydeus mountain ranges, where they had been able to evade the majority of the Imperium's attention up until the return of the beast. By themselves, these orc forces presented absolutely no threat whatsoever to the defenders of Armageddon. Their numbers were considerable, to be sure, but they had virtually nothing in the way of technology. Whereas the usual orc weapons could be considered to be crude, these poor bastards were essentially using sticks and stones and the occasional arrow. But with the prevailing situation of utter and complete fucking chaos, the Imperial Guard was not at their best. As such, the appearance of hundreds of thousands of unexpected combatants in their rear lines would prove to be a major impediment to their combat effectiveness, and it also made the simple act of moving across the plant of Armageddon considerably more complicated than it would originally have been assumed to be. Before that, the only real threat to Imperial supply lines would come from orc drop pods, which while that was a considerable danger, any large-scale orc landing would have to run a gauntlet of Imperial Navy air power, as well as orbital defences, what little remained, and of course they would be very, very predictable. Even the orcs could not drop forces directly onto the planet without first moving ships into position. Any large-scale deployment would give the Imperial Guard hours at the very least and possibly even days worth of warning. However, vast hordes of feral orcs moving rapidly and erratically across the landscapes were considerably harder to uh, predict, and at this point in time there was absolutely no way that the Imperial Navy could dedicate void resources to keeping a track of them, nor could the Imperial Navy's ground-based aircraft and fighters be spared to keep a constant lookout for orc hordes, 
which meant that if the ground forces wanted to keep a lookout for these orc hordes, they would have to do it the good old fashioned way, by dispatching forces from the front lines and sending them out to track down the orc hordes, and then keeping in constant contact with them and report back to their parent regiments, which would then have to of course be passed up the chain of command, and yadi yadi yadi. It all essentially meant that an already chaotic and confusing situation was further obfuscated by the need to track and report on the movement of enemies that usually would not warrant such attention. After a full five days of fighting, the initial phase of the war could be said to be more or less complete. The air war above Armageddon had petered to a standstill, the orcs had been able to land in considerable numbers and were roaming across the countryside. The feral orcs provided further distractions for the Imperial defenders, and the Imperial navy had been stretched to the absolute breaking point with most of their airborne assets and their ground bases either being heavily damaged or simply just outright destroyed. They would continue to offer limited support throughout the war, but for now, the Orcs had essentially air superiority, and combined with their complete and utter void superiority, this means that the Orcs could land their troops wherever they pleased. Normally, this would simply result in the Orcs emptying everything they have in space down upon the planet and heading straight for the largest, shiniest objective. However, Gazgul Mag Uruk Thraka was, as we all know at this point, no normal Orc. Yarik had already supposed that the Great Orc Warlord would first seek to establish aerial supremacy, which he now had, and would then begin encircling the Hive cities. This was partially true, but the Great Orc Warlord had a bit of a surprise in mind. During the last war, he had perfected strategies that utilized the speed of his Orc forces. Yarik expected to see tactics like that return, but he had underestimated just how much Gazgul had modified these tactics between the campaign on Golgotha and the invasion of Armageddon. It would appear that the beast had not quite shown its full hand when fighting Yarik's crusade on Golgotha. These new tactics were surprisingly clever by Orc standards, but they were also undeniably Orcish. Gazgul would use his forces essentially as unguided missiles. He would take the Imperium's strength, namely their fortified positions, their advantage of terrain, cover, and armament, and use that against them. Instead of simply deploying his forces onto the planet, and then began surrounding the various strong points and high of cities, allowing the Imperial defenders a chance to engage in a fighting retreat where they could inflict considerable casualties on the Orcs with their mobile forces, while still being able to maintain most of their formations and combat readiness, instead, Gazgul would simply drop his troops directly between the Imperial forces. This denied the Imperial Guard the chance to simply withdraw to the fortified Hive cities, and allowed the Orcs to inflict heavy casualties upon the Imperial forces as they tried to break through this sudden encirclement to regain their posture and join up with the rest of their allies. And the Orcs could only do this due to a brand new innovation from Gazgul uh, Mag Uruk Thraka. You remember those massive rocks I talked about in the Void War video that are protecting the rear lines of the Orcs? Well, this was their final destination. The rocks would be dropped directly onto the planet as fully functioning forward bases. Many of them were equipped with teleporter devices, allowing supplies to be brought down from orbit directly on to the planet without the need for bulk conveyors. This also gave the Orcs a heavily fortified forward base, strutting with all manners of artillery emplacements and anti-infantry weaponry. Attacking a Rook was very, very difficult. In the early days of the invasion, it was made a priority to attack and destroy these landing sites as quickly as possible. The idea was that if these forward bases could be destroyed, then the Orcs would once again have to bring down supplies the old-fashioned way, and it would also deny the Orc Horde a jumping-off point for further offensives. However, the sheer number of rocks available in orbit, and the amount of forces necessary to destroy a single landing site, 
quickly made it apparent to the Imperial commanders that it simply wasn't worth it. The rocks were extremely heavily fortified, they were spaceships armoured in metres of armoured plating, and sprouting guns from every single nook and goddamn cranny, and to that, hundreds of thousands of greenskins pouring out from inside the massive constructs. This meant that any attack upon the rocks would have to be a large one to have any real chance of success. Imperial tacticians quickly determined that a force of at least 12 regiments would be needed to knock out a single rock landing site. And of course, if these were individual occurrences, that would not be a particularly large problem. However, this had to be taken in the context of the larger war. Besieging the rocks and starving them out would prove utterly futile due to their ability to bring down supplies from orbit. Sieging the rocks and grinding them down over a lengthy period of constant escalations and assaults was also deemed to be impractical, simply because the orcs could continuously bring in more reinforcements, and any regiments dedicated to such an action would have to be kept in place for months, possibly even years and keeping several hundred thousands of men occupied in what is essentially a containing action for years was not something the defenders of Armageddon could afford. This meant that the only remaining realistic option was to dedicate large formations of armour, super heavy artillery and preferably Astartes forces to each and every drop site. And at that point the grim arithmetic of war kicks into motion. Attacking the rock landing site might deny the orc a temporary advantage in the area, until another rock could be brought down. However, it would require the expenditure of considerable amounts of munitions and imperial troops, while simply defending against the rock landing site would require considerably fewer troops, considerably less ammunition, and at the end of the day would free up much larger imperial forces either to defend other locations or to counterattack in areas where their forces might actually make a real difference. Some rocks were assaulted and destroyed out of grim necessity, however, when they had fallen either within the defences of a hive or simply just inside of the hive itself. But for the most part, the rocks were to be left alone until large forces could be guaranteed to be available and preferably Astartes cajoled into spearheading an assault upon them and it was lucky that the Imperium took this stance, because the rocks in and of themselves were only the first part of Thraka's great plan. The green-skinned warlord had originally hoped that the Imperium would do just what they had considered, and launch large-scale counterattacks out against the apparently relatively exposed landing sites to deny the orcs access to reinforcements and resupply. In response, Gazgul would simply drop rocks behind the forces, engaging the landing sites, and potentially surrounding and wiping out vast Imperial formations, and even more importantly, these formations would almost certainly be made up of the more powerful elements of the Imperial defenders. Luckily for the Imperium, they did not fall for this particular piece of bait. Instead, they hung back in their defensive fortifications, and watched as the beast plans began to materialise. As he had been denied his obvious trap, the Beast of Armageddon simply began Phase 2. The rocks began landing across the planet in ever greater numbers, surrounding any forces that would be exposed or potentially separated from the main defensive lines. And if the Imperium tried to form coherent battle lines outside of the protective covering of the hives or larger installations, the Orc would bombard them from orbit to break open the large formations. Orc auspexes are not the best and cannot detect anything other than very large formations. As such, the Imperial defenders were still relatively safe to move across the planet, but they could not gather in large quantities, and they could not begin building fortifications that would be visible readily from orbit without having access to void shield generators to protect themselves, or, potentially also, the nearby proximity of orcs. Orc void born ordinance is remarkably inaccurate. Even the Imperium has a hard time hitting targets smaller than entire cities from orbit, the orcs have a hard time hitting something the size of continents. And this also came into full and rather brutal focus when it came to the orc rocks. 
You see, one of the reasons why I mentioned this particular tactic was uniquely orcish is how they were deployed. The Orc Rocks were not only deployed in front of defensive positions, but also to the rear of said positions. With little, if any, consideration being made for the survival of the Orcs involved, many of these Orc Rocks were simply dropped on the planet in strategic positions where they could either confound or entirely block Imperial reinforcements and troop movements, regardless of how many hundreds of thousands of Orcs would die, as they were massively outpositioned and under fire from considerable amounts of ordnance. All Gazgul really cared about was trapping the maximum number of Imperial Guard forces. He could easily afford to sacrifice dozens of Orcs for every Imperial Guardsman lost. He had the numbers, and he had the reinforcements. This essentially amounts to an evolution of the tactics used during the First War for Armageddon. Instead of simply breaking through the enemy's defensive lines and then cutting deep into their rear, the concept of defensive lines was entirely bypassed to begin with. Instead, the Orcs would simply land behind the enemy and then start causing havoc directly in their rears, attempting to split up the enemy's forces and attack them piecemeal. Essentially, the goal here was to reduce the entire battle from the concept of standard positions and line of defense to a bunch of individual brawls and continuous running battles throughout the planet, an environment in which the Orcs would excel whilst the Imperium, who rely on mutually supporting regiments to work at their full effectiveness, would be put at a considerable disadvantage. However, it was very similar to the previous concept of deep operations in one very particular way, namely the fact that it put the invading forces at a massive initial disadvantage and required huge resources to pull off. Essentially, Gazgul was aiming to shatter the entirety of the Imperium's defensive fortifications in one gargantuan blow by throwing literally millions of orcs in deep strike unsupported operations directly into the Imperial troops. The orcs would be unsupported, separated, and heavily outgunned in many, many of these areas, since they were essentially deployed as blocking troops, while other landing sites might contain the primary assault forces. Now, even then, they didn't have the support of ready-made forward bases in the case of rocks, but even then, you could consider the fact that there's about 80 to 100 rocks. Some were kept back in the void, meaning that you're likely to look at something between 40 to 50. That is a considerable amount of forward bases, but these forward bases were just that forward bases. The Orcs would have to leave them to really get Gazgul's plan underway. The casualties suffered by the Orc hordes in the early days of the invasion were no doubt monstrous, and they would continue at an absolutely ludicrous rate of attrition throughout this part of the operation as well. Normally, the planetary landing in and of itself is the deadliest part of any battle for an invading force. Gazgul had lengthened that part to include practically the entire battle. However, if successful, the entire scenario would be turned on its head. The Imperium would be denied their greatest strength, and the Orcs would be able to roam across the planet at will. However, that does not necessarily mean that the plan was entirely without contingencies. Gazgul assumed that orcs would do what orcs do, because remember, orcs are never beaten. If they run away, then they live to fight another day. And Gazgul relied upon this part of orc nature to kick in. If the Imperium were to launch a concentrated counterattack, for example to rescue a pocket of Imperial defenders, and would destroy a landing zone or a large formations of orcs, like for example what happened to the Blackfire tribe, the orcs were then expected to scatter into the wilderness of Armageddon, where the Imperium would find it extremely difficult to follow them, and then continue continue to launch guerrilla raids against their attackers, and thereby contributing to the overall chaos, which was Gazgul's ultimate goal.
And so then, to summarise this first phase of the ground war, Gazgul had launched his invasion forces, they had successfully made it down to the surface, the vast majority of orbital defences had either been knocked out or taken over by the orcs, and he had managed to bring down most of his forces relatively intact. It now turned out that the drop legions were not there to bring down orcs, they were there to neutralise the defences to bring down the rocks. And while several rocks were still lost due to the fact that orc engineering is, well, orky, and several were also brought down by the remaining orbital offensive batteries, many, many, many more made it down to the surface. However, the Imperium did not bite quite as hard as Gazgul would have hoped, which did not let him cut off vast swaths of Imperial forces. There were, as mentioned, some localised counterattacks against rock landing sites, before the cost of such actions were made apparent. Commissar Yarek himself led some successful assaults at the head of Cadian stormtroopers supported by the titans of Legio Metallica and Legio Ignatum, and destroyed several orc fortresses. However, in other parts of the planet, assaults on rocks were eating up entire regiments in matters of hours, an entirely unsustainable rate of loss. Which is why, finally, the campaign to destroy the orc landing sites were abandoned. During the later stages of the war, the primary responsibility for dealing with these rocks would fall upon the broad shoulders of the Adeptus Astartes and the Titan Legions. As for the overall situation, the Imperial Guard had fared relatively well. The Orcs had not been able to carry out any large-scale encircling operations outside of the various hives. There was the unfortunate series of events that occurred outside of Hive Volcanus, where several regiments of Imperial Guard Hive Militia were routed and the Hive itself surrounded, but other than that, no large-scale Imperial forces had been cut off and destroyed. And while this was a severe blow, the Hive itself was still fighting. Of much greater import was the fall of Acheron without a bullet being fired, due to the intervention of the traitor overlord von Straub. In other areas, the fighting had been heavy, but not catastrophic, and outside of Hive Deathmire, the Imperium had won their first great victory, destroying an entire Orc tribe. Otherwise, Gazgul Mag Uruk Thraka's strategies were proving effective. It turned out to be entirely hopeless for the Imperium to create large-scale formations outside of the defensive protection of the Hives. Any large-scale counterattack would be broken up by orbital bombardment, any efforts to to create additional lines of defence would be similarly disrupted. This meant that Imperial forces were forced back into the Hive cities far earlier than had originally been anticipated. Originally, Yarik had hoped to be able to prosecute a war of manoeuvre against the Orcs in the first few weeks of their landing. Assuming that the Orcs would be unable to bring down the massive numbers of vehicles, tanks and gargants required to prosecute such a war, at the very least for the first few weeks, this would have let the Imperium inflict considerable casualties upon the Orcs while the Imperium maintained the superiority in terms of manoeuvrability. This plan was, however, to prove impractical, not only because the Orcs were capable of bombarding any large-scale formations, but also due to the deployment of the Rooks and their massive teleportation arrays. The Orcs were not only able to bring down vast quantities of equipment, reinforcements and troops, but huge numbers of vehicles, tanks, trucks, battle fortresses and even gargants. These deployments denied the Imperium this early advantage, since it was deemed that any deployment of large-scale mobile forces would be far too risky as they would have to be spread out over a large area of ground to avoid getting obliterated from orbit, which would in return leave them open to being smashed apart and surrounded by highly mobile and highly powerful columns of orc vehicles. Similarly, the possibilities of attacking the drop sites directly were quickly discarded due to the reasons we have already discussed. This meant that the only viable course of option for the Imperial Defenders was to fall back to the Hives and the heavily defended areas just outside of them. A few fortifications along strategic choke points would still be held, as well as the original idea of running mobile forces up and down the highways, as these were assumed to be too small to be accurately attacked from orbit. It was also assumed that Gazgul would not risk destroying the highways, as he would be needing these to transport his own troops 
troops, assuming he could capture the hives. In all essentiality, the first week of the war was not going particularly well for the Imperial Guard. Most of their plans had had to been discarded, and many of the advantages they were expecting to have against an enemy forcing planetfall had been countered ever so deftly by the Beast of Armageddon. As for the other Imperial troops on the planet, they had fared considerably better. The Mechanicus had not suffered any significant losses during the first week of combat, and had contributed to the largest Imperial victory so far. Likewise, the Adeptus Astartes were having an absolute ball of a time. When the Orcs retreated to the more hostile areas of Armageddon to avoid the sledgehammer that was the Imperial Guard, they would find the Adeptus Astartes waiting for them, and they could run absolutely rampant through the Orc hordes. Although the Orcs would have a significant advantage over the Imperial Guard in such areas and in such times of chaos, the Adeptus Astartes were more than capable of dealing with the Orcs, even in the most hostile areas of Armageddon. And they did not require the coordination that the Imperial Guard did. Even just individual squads of Adeptus Astartes could take on a considerably larger formations of Orcs, wreak absolute havoc upon them, and then simply just fade back into the wilderness. The Astartes had also managed to maintain far more of their maneuverability than the Imperial Guard had. Whereas the Imperial Navy had almost been rendered entirely null and void at this point after having been thrown at the invader quite recklessly in the opening week, the Adeptus Astartes had maintained their Thunderhawks and were now using them to traverse the wilderness at high speed. They were more than a match for the Orc fighter bombers, and they were capable of operating out of the wilderness at least as effectively as the Orcs were. As for the Greenskins themselves, everything so far had gone more or less to plan. The guerrilla tactics originally intended for usage by Gazgol Mag Uruk Thraka for any forces that were to fall back from the Imperial advance had been given a somewhat nasty dent by the presence of so many Adeptus Astartes. But by and large, the first week of combat had been a resounding success for the Orcs. They had been able to capture or disable the vast majority of the Imperium's orbital defences. What little remained was not much of a threat. Most of the rocks had already been able to land, and had been fortified against Imperial counterattacks. A few had been lost in transit, and a few more to Imperial counterattacks, but all in all, the Orcs had managed to secure a solid foothold upon the planet of Armageddon, and they had done so without leaving themselves open to counterattacks. They had undoubtedly suffered millions of casualties forcing the landing, but this was to be expected. Getting a foothold on a planet is never easy. The defender is going to have all the advantages of air power, of defenses, of orbital of fortifications, etc., etc. And most of the opening gambits had paid off. The infiltration strike against Acheron had been a resounding success. The surprise attack on High Volcanus had also met with considerable, if not complete, success and the landing themselves had fallen well within acceptable parameters. Granted, large Imperial forces had not been lured out of the Hive cities, and subsequently been decapitated by further rock strikes, but this was a relatively minor inconvenience. Of slightly more notice was the failed attack upon Hive Deathmire, which led to the destruction of an entire Orc tribe. But from the very beginning, this was a calculated risk. The tribe had been landed without most of their heavy equipment, and had been expected to launch a surprise attack upon Hive Deathmire, much as like what had happened at Volcanus, except this time they had been spotted far too early, and they had paid the price. And finally, of course, the Orcs had secured almost complete air superiority. The Imperium had thrown its Imperial Navy reserves at what they thought to be the main Orc landings, which now turned out to be a mere distraction. The Rocks were the main push. The Drop Legions had simply been created to destabilize the original Imperial Guard deployments, to drag attention away from the Rocks, and of course, to give the Imperial Navy something to throw themselves at. The bulk of the invasion forces were now transported down to the plant of Armageddon via gigantic teleportation arrays located inside of the rocks. Heavy armor, transport, the mobs themselves, and gargants were all transported to the planet's surface in this far safer manner. Or, well, 
safe by orc standards anyways. Safe by the standards of having to drop through an entire planet's worth of orbital defences and Imperial Navy interceptors. It is all quite relative. And as an added bonus, Gazgul had been able to get away with another fairly large gamble. After the initial landings had taken place, large hordes of orc landers had been seen landing in the fire wastes. This had confounded Imperial tacticians, since they could see no reason why the orcs would be landing in this area. The fire wastes, by the way, is essentially a massive area covered with volcanoes and all manners of horribleness. The Imperial Guard would find it hard to live in these areas, the orcs would almost certainly find it virtually unbearable, and during the worst periods, the so-called Season of Fire, the area was virtually unlivable. It would be covered in piping hot ash falls, constantly raining down from the sky as a byproduct of all of the volcanoes kicking into overdrive and spewing lava all across the area. And as mentioned, there was nothing of strategic value there. There were no oil fields, as in the south, there was no strategic military installations, there were no highways, and there were no hives. There was simply no apparent reason for the orcs to land in this area. But the beast must surely have had a reason, mustn't he? Well, we'll get to that. But I am going to torture you with that for yet another week. We have now covered the Void War, and we have covered the initial landings. The Orcs had managed to pull off most of their tactical objectives, and had managed to force Planetfall with a relatively minor amount of casualties. Minor. Relatively speaking, the Imperium had, however, done relatively well for itself. No large-scale formations had been destroyed, and although the highs were not supposed to be falling or being surrounded this early, no major Imperial formations had so far been annihilated. Don't get me wrong, the casualties already in this early part had been significant. The casualties around Hive Acheron would probably have been catastrophic. Additionally, several regiments were wasted in attacking the Orc Rocks. In all due likelihood, we're looking at casualties somewhere along the lines of a couple hundred thousand in the first week of engagement for the Imperial troops and a couple million for the Orcs. The problem was, however, that the Imperium was expecting to inflict considerably larger casualties. The landings themselves and the first week or two are the points where the Defender usually has the largest advantage. However, Gazgul had expertly managed to deny these advantages to the Imperium, and had indeed managed to turn many of these disadvantages to his own advantage, and delivered a crippling blow to the Imperium at Acheron, and a considerable one at High Volcanus. The first week was, in other words, inconclusive. Both sides had suffered casualties, both sides had suffered reversals and successes, and both sides had seen parts of their strategies succeed and others proven to be quite detrimental to their efforts. The old saying, no plan survives contact with the enemy, had been proven true once again, and it was now up to the strategists on both sides to roll with the punches and develop new plans. Who would strike back first? Who would be able to turn these disadvantages to advantages? And who would be able to deliver the first truly telling blow to the enemy? Join me next week when we find out. Until then, I have been Arch. Thank you very much for watching, and I do hope to see you all again soon. Have a good day.